So hi, I'm Niklas Tanskanen. As Vlad said, I work at Epico as a DevOps consultant. And today's topic is about monitoring. Uh, we're going to get a bit technical here, but uh, there's some business side as well. There it is. So what is Prometheus and Open Version? Uh, well, Prometheus, that's a time series database. You have value, you have timestamp, and then you have metadata that describes what the value is about and where did it came from and stuff like that. Open tracing, that's for user experience monitoring. Uh, imagine that you have in your application a path, you have multiple microservices there, and the user request travels through these microservices in order to complete the request. Open tracing is a technology for that, so you can uh, trace what's happening between those microservices. So Prometheus, timestamp, value, and meta. And there are four types of metrics in Prometheus. There's gauge that has minimum and maximum value, and, and it's observable at any given time. Then there's counter, it goes always up. Histogram, uh, the best way to describe a histogram is that you would have incoming requests and you response to those requests, HTTP requests, with a specific status code. And when you respond with 200, you put the request in 200 bucket. So here I would have different buckets and every time the request uh, ends up with 200, I will put the ball in 200 and the bar will go higher. That's histogram. Summary, uh, also a metric type. It's basically the same as histogram, but you would have some specific value that you want to track. And uh, it's used, for example, like uh, you would have service latency and you would want to know that how does the service latency show up in the user. So basically it answers to the question that 95% uh, of my users are getting the service for this latency and 5% of the users are getting it for this latency and 50% for this latency. These are the history. Uh, different types of metrics that Prometheus has. It's important to know that the Prometheus itself is quite dumb. It's just a time series database. It's just for storing and growing information. But from these interesting uh, values, you can refine interesting data. So how it works? You have your application there, uh, and Prometheus uh, uses your application's interface to fetch data. It saves the data to the time series database. And then the fun part begins. You have the data inside Prometheus, and uh, you can visualize it using different tools like Grafana, or you can refine it further with tools like uh, Facebook Profit, which is an AI tool for refining the time series data. And then you push the profit data back to Prometheus and visualize it using Grafana. Prometheus also has a features for alert manager, alert, alert managing, like uh, you would define a set of rules that if, if this value goes below this or uh, then you would send alert to different channels. And I think that in modern software development, uh, this time series data is almost as important as the user data. For example, Netflix has a team of 10 operators. They have 50 million different values of time series data. And they use this data uh, to visualize and uh, gain insights on how their infrastructure and application are working. So, do the demo. I have a simple architecture here, uh, it's a sandwich shop, it has a UI, 
API server that's coded in JRPC. I have a Kafka in between these two components here and the order gets uh, transferred through the Kafka to the cook. The cook finishes the order, transfers the order back to JRPC server and all this can be monitored using the Prometheus. So I have instrumented my Breadway server here with Prometheus code so that Prometheus can uh, get data from the server and store it. The same I have done for Kafka server here. So this is the shop. And uh, let's make a new order. So I want to order a tuna sandwich. Here. And if I now go to Grafana and visualize the order that I just made. So these types here, they are all counters. So I have four counter, four orders in the service. Yes, there's four. And I have two sandwich options. This is the data uh, that the Prometheus gets from my server. And it's not only for the technical stuff, it's also for the business stuff. You could add business metrics into your application and then allow them to flow to Prometheus and create these dashboards. And then there's all, all kinds of nerd stuff that you can get from your infrastructure, CPU monitoring, disk monitoring, all that boring stuff, IO output. And by visualizing you can create these amazing dashboards and you have better insight what's going on inside your application or inside your infrastructure or inside your business. So that's from it. And then microservices. So the promise of microservices is that uh, they are easy to test, easier to manage because the code base is smaller than, than it is of the monoliths. Uh, they are more testable because they are smaller. And it's true, the smaller applications is, it's easier to test than a big monolith. But running these microservices that's harder. When I previously had one monolith that I needed to install and deploy, now I have 20 applications. And I need to deploy everything. I maybe need to deploy them in the right, correct order, so that the dependencies between those microservices won't fail. Uh, testing a full set of microservices, it's crazy, because you have a different version dependencies. Uh, deploying full set of microservices, harder than a monolith and then there's the troubleshooting when I previously had one monolith I can pretty much see the function calls in an IDE that one leads to another blah 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 and at least I have some kind of clue what happened in production when I'm using the IDE and flow following through the stack trace keeping in mind the, all the values that the user had when he, was, he or she was doing the request. But the microservice architecture, it's impossible. Because if the services have different dependencies and they are linked, or if they have third-party dependencies, or if they have database dependencies, or if they have message broker dependencies, uh, it becomes a mess. Because you can't just uh, go through the logs and uh, uh, review the logs for every different microservice and uh, and uh, 
try to keep up with the different requests of the HTTP requests or whatever your service has. Crazy. But here is the actual program, problem that you're still thinking about deploying and uh, running 20 different monoliths. But this is a microservice architecture. It's a different thing. It, it, it requires a totally different approach to troubleshooting. And the solution for this is open tracing. Uh, open tracing uh, is a technology where actions in your microservice mess uh, is traceable, meaning that the request travels through your microservices uh, perhaps multiple microservices, multiple databases, multiple message brokers, and every action in this uh, microservice, in this uh, microservice mess, uh, launches a uh, trace. And the trace looks like this. So this is trace, and these colorful bars here are spans. Each span has a duration, how long did it took, and each span represents a different thing. It could be a database call, it could be a call to another microservice, it could be a call to a message broker, uh, and of course you would uh, enrich this trace with metadata. So if I would have uh, like a shop, a web shop, I could uh, add here the user that was doing this request, the server, uh, the order ID maybe, uh, to help you locate the actual user or, or your actual business transaction. Whatever. And uh, it's important to know that open tracing, it's, uh, it's kind of an umbrella term. It's kind of like containers as a term. It's not strict. It defines what is a trace and what is a span, but the protocols uh, uh, that is used to report these spans and uh, traces from your application to the tracing platform, that's up to you. And there are multiple ones. There's a few uh, from Uber. Uh, that uses this technology to trace the, their application and uh, it's called Jager. Then there's a Apache a project called Skywalking, uh, an interesting and pretty new platform for uh, storing these traces and analyzing them. So, the architecture, same as before, uh, I have the UI, it calls the API server, and API server do, does the traces. And for the demo, I can show you the traces that the API server did when I did the order just a few moments ago. So this is the skywalking uh, UI. Okay. Whoa. If you have used the uh, app dynamics or or uh, New Relic. Uh, they all look the same. So this is the order I made a few minutes ago. It's not much, but this is the function in the API server that sends the order object to Kafka. And in this span, I have enriched the data with order ID. So the order ID was 4, 
if I refresh this, this is the order number four. So it's here. So a use case to this would be that the user complains that I'm not able to get my order through. Like there's some error, I don't care, fix it now. I would go here, I would search for the order ID and I could immediately see the path in my code that was executed. I can also use this for data, I can also add the database uh, uh, course here or whatever. It's up to you. And this is not mine, mine UI, but uh, I wanted to show you this uh, topology view. So this is achieved through um, distributed tracing. So the trace uh, travels with the user request to this microservice and it does its own spans and here to Kafka, maybe to another Kafka. And by utilizing the uh, distributed tracing, uh, one can see all the different paths that the uh, request took. So these different colors here, like this green and blue, they represent a different service, different microservice. So if there's original, original uh, Endpoint is here, the project A slash test. It launches a request to project B, another service, project C. Project C uses uh, Kafka, and project B uses uh, database. And these database queries are also uh, enriched with the data like uh, which statement was ex executed. So yeah, for me, I think this is uh, in modern software development as important as doing unit testing or logging if you are doing microservices. But of course it's not ready or it is and it isn't. A few things that you need to know about. The first is that if you have a service that is used a lot, like Uber, you cannot just collect all the traces. That would create a huge amount of data. So you need to think about your sampling strategy. Do you maybe uh, collect all the traces that have errors? Or is it a probability? Or what not? Yeah, Uber and Jaeger is working on uh, adaptive sampling, meaning that the AI adjusts your sampling rate. If there's a lot of errors, you might want to increase the sampling rate, that how many requests are sampled that go in. Then another thing uh, is UI. That's pretty much uh, left alone in this uh, modern software development. But it's important to uh, profile the UI as well. But these are only uh, just starting, uh, starting projects in open source world that we need to trace the UI as well. When the user clicks the button, uh, how long does it took in the UI to show you the, show you the information from the request that goes through the microservices and then goes, then gets back to you. Why? Why wouldn't I just buy AppDynamics or New Relic? Well, they are expensive. And this is more about DevOps, really. Of course you can do that. You can buy AppDynamics and you can keep your developers uh, writing the code you want, you want, 
or if the product owner wants more business functions, more business value. But in that way, the developers, they don't get engaged with the, with the production. They don't engage with the um, product. And if they don't, uh, they really don't have any insight or ownership of the application that they are developing. So I would argue that doing just simple instrumentation of their code leads only lead, leads to a better understanding how it really works in production and how it really serves the user. There's a thing called BIS DevOps. It's I, I, I really don't know what it means. It has business and DevOps. I guess it means that that the uh, the metrics that I showed you, like how many sandwiches there are ordered today, uh, that's business metric. And you can use these Prometheus and time series data to do these BIS DevOps things together with the infrastructure and application metric things. So it's not only for the uh, nerds. There's no vendor lock in open source. And the best thing is that you can yourself contribute to these tools. If you have a problem or if you need a feature, uh, of course you can request vendor to provide it. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they will ask for money. And the argument for open source is that you have unlimited number of developers when you are using open source tools, like Linux. When you are buying stuff from someone, they will have a limited number of developers. So, I don't know which one do you want. And in my humble opinion, every successful organization contributes to open source. We at Epico do it, but <laughs> also the biggest companies like Uber, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, they all contribute to open source. And why we are here in this conference, I guess it's for better software. It's for better software to the users. If it's better software to the users, it will lead to a better developer experience, unless the uh, better software is created from the tiers of the developers. But all this uh, tracing and metrics, they are important to the developer experience because they can actually see what's happening in production. It doesn't have to be a black box. And by understanding what's happening, uh, the management has a better clue uh, what the problems here are and where should we put more effort because there's always going to be problems and we can ignore them or you can deal with them. This is the dealing way. The ignoring is easy. And by sharing this information you are slowly transforming your organization to DevOps organizations. And of course at EFICODE we would be happy to help you with all these technologies and how to get started. Now, any questions? That took 24 minutes. <laughs> yes. I have a question regarding the Prometheus, uh, maybe also related to the open tracing. So, um, what do you see uh, Kind of like the main beneficial of the Prometheus against like the L stack because also the L stack is why like established already. Oh yes, uh, but L stack is a different thing. It's for logging. It's for, uh, for uh, logging stuff and uh, then analyzing these logs. It's not covered here. Uh, the Prometheus is just for uh, you have like value and time series, like time series. 
but uh, for X stack, uh, that's completely a different thing. <laughs> so Prometheus and X stack, uh, they are not uh, competitors. Right? Yeah, did you catch my catch my tip? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Because also, in a way, you can still set up them up in two sub the same purpose, like monitoring the kind of like um, the, the system and then kind of analyzing the data. Mm. Yeah, uh, monitoring is, uh, is a funny aspect because you have so much thing, so much, so many things to monitor. So, and you easily get lost. You easily get lost with all the data that is coming in because that's easy uh, to get data inside Elkstack or Prometheus. But analyzing that data, that requires a data scientist skills. And what is important? Because maybe for the more regarding the ease of setup, because also the thing is like we, we collect data is one thing, but how we analyze is another thing. Yes. So in the beginning, you just ensure that you collect as much data as possible without losing anything, and yeah. then leave it to somebody else to have the experts on. Yes. The but usually, I've seen that everyone is excited about this. Then they get the data in the system, they don't understand it, and uh, the project dies. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you said that Prometheus is just a database, or just just a just a store, and yes. the actual transport to have to put stuff into it is many can vary, but there's many different ways to do that. So, how do you technically send a signal to Prometheus? Are you putting in your code additional calls to that, or is yeah, it wrapped it's an, around everything? Yeah, it's an uh, HTTP request. The Prometheus does it for you, yeah. and. Uh, it queries the uh, endpoint, Prometheus endpoint that you have in your application. And then from there it stores it to the Prometheus. So it's kind of like a pool architecture. Okay. Mm. And uh, how, do you, how do you authenticate between the. Is there any like. Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> and caveat of Prometheus. The authentication part uh, pretty much non existent. Yeah. You have a HTTP basic. If you want to use that, but uh, these are the things with the leading technology stuff that you don't always have. Like in Prometheus, there's also a problem with multi tenancy. Like, if you have a big organization with lots of different products and you don't want the other team to see other teams' metrics, that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Our questions? No, then I thank you for your time. Thank you.